Thanks for coming, everyone. For those of you who I have not met before, my name is Liz Frediani. I'm the Assistant Director for Special Events in Athletics. Um, you just press the mute button again. Brian and Amy, just make sure you unmute yourself when you start talking. Um, again, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm muting everyone as you guys come in. Just be mindful of that. And we are recording this session so that we can post it later. Um, a few things to note before we start, we're going to be going through a number of questions that were submitted prior to the start of this session. We will open up the meeting for live questions a little bit later. So if you have a question during that time, just open up the participants tab by going to the bottom right. And if you hover over your name, there's a raise hand option. So we'll we'll do it that way. Um, if anyone has any questions when we get to that point. Um, so with that, I'll introduce Amy Slade, women's across head coach, um, and athletics director Brian Barrio. Uh, do you would you two like to say some opening remarks? Hi everybody. Um, it's so good to see so many. Um, old new young alum i really miss all of you guys i'm super sad that we're not able to have our alumni weekend which is usually this upcoming weekend right liz yeah so um we thought this was a great way to just kick off the intro to uh brian barry our new athletic director who's done really amazing things um in his first six months unfortunately he ran into this massive roadblock called covid but We've been doing a really awesome job with our freshmen, just reintroducing them into the lacrosse society and um, just really, you know, taking this day by day. And he's been super supportive of us getting our programming off the ground and making sure that these kids can still play. So we're super excited. Um, we have a lot of really awesome things going on at UMBC, which I'm sure Greg and Brian will definitely hit on. But again, it's so great to see so many faces that um, I coached, some that I didn't coach, but I have really great relationships with. Um, who are in the coaching world and we're just really thankful that you guys all took the opportunity to, to log on today. So thank you guys so much. And hello, I, you know, thanks, Amy. I, I, uh, I did come in at an interesting time um, and it's obviously a shame that we can't, we can't do these things in person, but I, you know, I kind of think the, the silver lining in it, in it is, you know, as I watch Anna uh, walking on the beach there, um, fo you know, folks that, can't get here in person can be here for this. And so the fact that we've learned how to do these things and that we're doing them virtually and making it accessible to more people um, is probably a silver lining that we'll continue to, to have in the future. So, you know, trying to look at this as a, as a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block for us. Um, you know, and Amy's done a really terrific job. I don't, I don't want to step on um, some of the questions that I know we have in the queue or that you may have. Um, but, you know, it's remarkable what all our coaches and, and Amy in particular have done during this time when we haven't been able to be in person to keep their student athletes engaged, to keep them feeling positive, to keep them moving forward um, and developing. And, you know, it's 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 always a talking point for me and something that I really care about that we're doing, uh, you know, that we're we're developing student athletes as people beyond just as as students or athletes. You know, there's that whole other part of the student of the person that's, you know, it's their family, it's their faith, it's the things in their life. Um, that are important to them. And, and, you know, that development is the part that I was most worried about as we went into this kind of hiatus. It's how do you continue to connect with young people and help them grow when they're sitting in their house? And, you know, it requires a, a tremendous amount of persistence and creativity. Uh, and I'm sure Amy will talk a little bit about some of the team building things that they've done, but I'm so impressed, um, you know, with Amy and with all of our coaches. And so it, that's been kind of the light during this sort of dark time is, you know, we've gotten really creative about how to stay connected. And that, to me, that's the UMBC way. We're being innovative. We care about the students. Um, and so, so to that end, even though we've been, we've had some pretty crushing disappointments in terms of having to cancel the fall, the spring season, um, having to postpone the fall seasons, uh, there's been some light during this time and it's been, it's been exciting to see. So I'm really happy to be here, even though we're virtual and get to know you all a little bit. And I hope um, I hope nobody's shy about asking questions or, or kind of feeling us out about what the future looks like here. But um, but just I, I want to thank you all for being here. Don't worry, this is not a shy group. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, we'll just dive right in. Amy, the first question is for you. How what does your incoming class look this year? Fast, feisty and athletic, which is like the best things you can describe um, as a freshman class. 
Um, and I was just actually telling Brian, the coolest thing about this freshman class is that, you know, dorm life isn't always the greatest life to begin with. And then throw COVID and all these other rules in there. Um, and you could imagine that being really challenging. Um, and then not being able to really mingle with your upperclassmen, even more challenging. But our freshmen, number one, they're having the time of their lives living on campus, which, you know, is awesome because I was a little bit nervous. Um, number two, they bonded so well as a team. Um, number three, they're extremely positive. Um, you know, it's funny today, one of our goalies who is at like, she's this tiny little bird. She was at the end of our running and turned to a senior and was like, hey, you did a really good job. And for a freshman to be able to do that to a senior who, you know, she they haven't even been able to get that interaction just shows like the character of that crew. Um, and so, you know, the freshman class has just been really, really awesome. And they've gone with the flow, which is like all we've asked of our student athletes. Um, and they do it without hesitation and positivity. Um, and it's really just a breath of fresh air. We have not had one complaint, which is unbelievable so i'm just so grateful for not just the freshmen but the whole class the whole you know team in general has really been so positive upbeat and just go with the flow that it's making our jobs really easy and can you talk a little bit about how the whole team has handled the new rules and restrictions for the fall and what you guys are kind of doing virtually to stay connected yeah, so we're super lucky because we moved into phase two because our girls follow rules and they really just want to get on the field. So we're on phase two, which means our whole team can practice. So we've had a first the first week of full practice with the entire team, and it's really been um, just super up uplifting. I know I have some other coaches on here. I think Grayson and, and Morgan might be out there somewhere, but it was just really great to be a part of their energy. Um, and so any opportunity that they get to be out there, they're taking full advantage of. And whether it's a run with Brian or, you know, it was the lift um, outside. We just uh, re recently went into the training, uh, the weight room for the first time on Monday. They're just taking advantage of every opportunity. And they um, and they're the type of class that really um, wants to take advantage of every opportunity. And when you know, something was taken away from them. I think they really started to value what was actually given to them. And I think they've done a lot of work on their own without the coaches even asking. Um, they have kind of internalized how important not only the sport of lacrosse is, but more importantly, the university, the team and UMBC as a whole. And so these kids, regardless of what happens, they're ready to go and they're super positive about every single thing that they do. Um, and it's been just so great to be a part of, you know, just the last two weeks. And we've only been in this for two weeks and it keeps getting better and better. So um, I didn't think I was going to say that, but it is. So we're super lucky. Yeah. And Amy, if I can make a point too, the, the, you know, if you look around the country and you look at athletic departments, what's happened, um, there's been there's been significant issues with student athletes complying with the COVID regulations on campuses all over the country. And it's understandable. Uh, you know, all of us were 19 or 20 years old. And, you know, it's it, it, it would be interesting. I don't know how many of you are aware of what the restrictions are on campus right now. Um, but, you know, the, like the the under the freshmen, you know, aren't allowed to have any visitors in their dorms. They're only allowed to have, I think, one person in their room for, from, you know, from outside of their room in their room at a time. Um, they're, they're not really allowed to go home if they live out of the area. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the college experience that we knew. And if you think about yourself when you were that age, that's a, that's a real challenge and it's a real, um, it probably feels like a real loss. And it's a real credit to, to Amy's student athletes and to her leadership and the culture on the team that they've responded so well to it. So we're, we're really impressed with what they've done. Amy, looking ahead to the spring, um, does the possibility of playing in a sort of bubble or more regionally affect your planning in any way? Um, I mean, not particularly. A couple of games here and there. Um, you know, Jen, VCU, where you at? We, um, we were supposed to obviously travel out of state, but we've really just, you know, following some of the rules that we've been given, trying to stay in state or, you know, limit the overnight trips. Obviously, financially, we want to make sure that we're being super smart. Um, and we're very, very lucky to have, you know, top 10 lacrosse in our backyard with Hopkins, Loyola, Towson, um, Maryland. You know, those are that's six out of conference games that we're driving up the road and back. So we're not really missing out on any competition, which is is really great. Um, 
And then if we needed to go to Philadelphia for the day, like I said, that's an up and back. So anything that's really up and back, we've been really trying to kind of stick to. And then in terms of in conference, I know they've they toyed around with a couple of ideas of, you know, maybe sanctioning an offer where we're not actually having to get on a plane and fly. So we're not taking that huge budgetary hit, which I know all schools are really trying to avoid. Um, and then obviously getting on a plane during COVID times isn't something that everyone's comfortable with. So I think. We're going to have a really great schedule, really competitive schedule, regardless of whether it's, you know, playing a couple of teams in our conference. We have we're surrounded by just really awesome competition. So um, either way, we're going to have great games, um, you know, in the state of Maryland, which would be really awesome and kind of keep us a little bit more isolated. Yeah, one of the, one of the challenges across the board in in college athletics right now and. You know, we talked about it very early in in the quarantine period, kind of in in early April. Is you know, for for a bunch of reasons, we've got to schedule regionally and locally. You know, Amy touched on the financial piece, which obviously is a consideration. But you know, we're also thinking about travel restrictions between states, and the idea that you know we're much more likely to play a game in Maryland than we are a game that's scheduled to to be in Florida or North Carolina or wherever have you. So, you know, we've really focused in all the sports on trying to schedule in Maryland for the time being, or at least as close to Maryland as we can. Um, you know, A, it's 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 obviously the financially responsible thing to do. B, we know that that institutions in Maryland are gonna have the same state restrictions that we do. Um, and C, I don't know if this is three or C, whatever I said, um, you know, it's also gonna be easier to make up if it does get canceled. You know, if we if we pop a positive test and have to have to postpone a game. We're much more likely to be able to make up a game with Loyola than a game with Stetson or somebody, you know, far out of our, out of our region. So, for all those reasons, Amy's done a good job pulling that schedule together. Brian, when we have all of our sports back up and running, everyone's playing. Do you feel like UMBC will be ahead of the curve, about normal, behind in terms of preparation? I know we won't be behind. Um, I, you know, our student, uh, my expectation is that we'll be, we'll have used this time as productively as anybody we're competing against, because that's been our focus since day one. You know, the, the, what we've said again and again and again as a group is, you know, this, you can't change what's going on in the world right now. You can't change what we're, you know, the kind of the hand we've been dealt in terms of COVID, but what you do have control over is how you use this time. And when we talked about it earlier, you know, the, the coaches have been incredibly creative in coming up with ways to engage their teams and help them grow. And that goes for within their sport as well as kind of as people. So, you know, I think there's been some really creative approaches to to developing as athletes as well during this time, and and it's going to pay off. And you know, even in the even in in terms of recruiting, um, you know, we've had this this in person recruiting ban for the whole kind of the whole COVID period. But coaches have gotten really creative with having um, vir virtual official visits. And it's let um, it's let prospects meet with more people on campus than they would have if they have, if they had come here in person. So you know, there's all these different ways that that we've used this time productively um, that I think are going to make us or put us in a better position when we come back than some of our competitors. Because I know, just you know, just from the COVID protocol violations on other campuses, I know that there's athletes out there who are not taking this as seriously as ours. And you know, to me, that's a good sign about where we're going to be when when we get back on our feet. I don't know if Amy has, has additional thoughts on that. That's what I was just going to ask. No, I think, um, you know, we're right on par. I, I will hats off to Stacy and sports medicine who've just done a really great job of making sure that we're not, um, you know, we take it really seriously to make sure we're not pushing our kids from going from zero to a hundred. Like there is definitely gotta be a grace period. So between um, Stacy and Brian coming up with a really great protocol to make sure that we get our kids safely back on the playing field and with minimal injuries, um, you know, I think is our ultimate goal. And so I think we're there, you know, we've, we had a practice of, you know, almost everyone other than some of like our surgical people that are still recovering was healthy and at practice. And that has not been something that's happened on our program for a very long time. So really like hats off to, you know, Stacy and Sam um, and Brian, who've really just helped us like really progress back into playing um, safely so that when we get to, you know, this time or January or this time next year, like we all, we have our ducks in line, we're ready to go. Um, and we just continue to build and get better. Awesome. Um, this question is for both of you. Fundraising is a priority in order to move things forward at UMBC. How do you see this playing out at, in the athletics department in general and specifically for women's lacrosse? Well, uh, you know, I'll talk generally and I'll let Amy talk a little bit about women's lacrosse. But, you know, I think 
fundraising is the lifeblood of of um, our ability to improve. And and for us to grow, continue growing and improving, we we have to we have to continue to persistently and aggressively and creatively raise money. Um, and that means we need, you know, I think traditionally we need support from two groups, most, you know, more than any other. And that's one, the group that we have here, our alumni who still care about the program. Um, and two, the parents of, of uh, our current student athletes and parents of our future student athletes. So, you know, those groups, I think, um, are really important to us. And, the, you know, the only way that we'll be successful in that, in, in, this, in the fundraising endeavor is if we have student athletes that have a great experience here and leave wanting to give back because they're grateful about what, what they had when they were here. That's, that's what it all comes down to. Did you have a great experience in your four years here? Did you feel competitive? Did you feel like you got better? Did you feel like UMBC and your athletic program made you a better person and a better employee and a better family member than you were when you, when you started? Um, and, you know, so we want, that's, that's goal one for us to make sure that when, when student athletes leave UMBC, they feel, they have that feeling and they feel connected for a lifetime. Um, and that, you know, that's, so I think, you know, for, for me in my first year here, one of the things that's why, you know, I think it's one of the reasons we're doing sessions like this, you know, I want every person who ever played here to feel like they're still part of this family. You know, I want you to feel like this is a place you can come home to, um, you know, and it's, it's not a connection just with your coach. It's not a connection just with your teammates. It's a connection with the institution and with the department. And it doesn't go away when people change. Um, it's got to be a lifetime, a lifetime connection. So we hope that we can, you know, I know that that's, I know that you, you probably, some of you probably already feel that way. Um, but I hope that we can begin to make it an even stronger connection and, and really have you feel like you're part of what we're doing here. And I, you know, and again, I, it's important because it's important in a regular year, but with COVID and the things that are going on here, I mean, we're, we're having to test, we're having to do clean and disinfect at a level that nobody's ever had to do this before. And all those things have, have costs. And so, you know, for us to do, for us to get better, we first got to take care of all the baseline expenses that certainly weren't in our budget when we prepared it before the pandemic. Um, so, you know, we're we're cert we we absolutely are looking for help from from the folks that care about this program, and and it's going to be the key to to us getting better. So, if you want to send your Clorox bleach to um, the event center, we will be there, ready to open our arms. We will accept it. Now, um, you know, I think the coolest thing about UMBC, um, and now I've been here for about 10 years, there's a lot of people in this call as I'm like trying to focus and scroll. There are, there are current players on here. Shout out to my girls. You guys are awesome for hopping on. There are past players that just graduated a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. And then there's girls that I've never even coached that are actually my age. So that I've competed against and played against. And some of them are in the coaching world now that I see out and about. And so I think the coolest thing about UMBC that hasn't been paid a, a lot of attention to in the past is that the relationships that like you guys as players build just continue to build and build and build. And I feel like we finally got to this really awesome, comfortable place where like we are all so proud to be UMBC alum and our relationships have really brought us together as one unit. And I think that's something that's really special about UMBC in general. Um, and, you know, I, I always talk about some of my current girls know that I talk about, you know, my experience at school and what I wanted to instill in everyone that came through, you know, our program was that they have this level and this feeling of connection to something that's bigger and bigger than them. Um, and that's, you know, obviously the UMBC name and then some of their best friends in the entire world where they're still on a group chat together. Well, they well, they still go and, you know, grab a drink together. Or they still go out and or they still come to homecoming or they still go on a girl's trip. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of, you know, from my college experience is that um, I have a class of eight and of that class of eight every year, all eight of us who we have three or more kids all go on vacation for three days. Um, and I know that there's some of these girls on you know, this call that do the same thing. And so being able to pass that lineage down from grade to grade and that experience from grade to grade. And um, I think that's something really important. I think that's really starting to happen as our program is really starting to turn that real positive corner. And so that's just a testament to all of you guys who have really just decided to be a strong part, a positive part of this program and continue to give back regardless of their, you know, experience um, and turn, maybe it wasn't the greatest, but they've turned it into a positive because of the people that they've been surrounded by um, the relationships that they've made. Um, and hopefully they love Alex Morgan and I and want to keep coming back and want to keep giving, but, you know, certainly, Donations is is something that's new to all of us because we're all we're all young and Brian I'm gonna speak for myself too because uh, you know I'm only well you're not speaking for me but that's okay <laughs> um, you know I'm only 37 and I have a university that asks the same questions of me and I think 
for all of us in my voice to you guys would just say like, it's not necessarily always about the dollar amount, unless you know a big hitter, like certainly, right, Greg, send them our way. But, um, you know, we want to really get a ton of participation for whatever that means for you guys. If that means $10 a year, $20 a year, like those are the things that I've just recently realized from my own experience that go a long way. Um, participation and really elevating the amount of participation. And so, um, you know, once COVID has hopefully subsided, we love to do a, a massive event where, you know, maybe we all meet downtown and have like a big UMBC bar night where we can just mingle with each other again. Um, obviously, homecoming is an amazing event that we put on at UMBC. Um, and then our bull roast, which notoriously has been just celebrating our girls. And we've had sprinklings of alumni here and there, uh, but making that more of an alumni focused event to meet and mingle the current kids, which um, I think is really, really important in the growth of a program. Yeah, you know, if I can throw one more one more thing out there, I mean, obviously, Amy mentioned, I mean, the financial support is important. Don't don't get me wrong. But the other thing that's important is you're here. Like the fact that you're on this call, the fact that you open an email when Amy sends it to you, the, the fact that you open an email when it comes from me about the department, that means a lot to us too. Um, and it means a lot that you're engaged and that you care about the program. That's that's maybe, that's possibly the most important thing. And, you know, it's, I think both Amy and I uh, have a background at, at, you know, at Power Five schools and those programs have big budgets. They've got big donors out there, ge multi-generational um, donors. And it's just kind of a, a different level of enterprise. For us here at UMBC, you know, you look around on this on this video call, this is UMBC lacrosse right here. And it's pretty awesome. And the fact that you have the ability to make such a high level impact um, just by showing up and being on this call um, is a different is a different deal. And it's kind of what makes our program special. And I, so again, I, I thanked you at the outset of the call and I'll thank you again now. It just means so much that you're all here because that's the first, you know, that's the first thing we need is is people who care about this program and are emotionally invested in this program. And it's it's obvious that we have that. So. So thank you. Thanks. Um, so Brian, you've been here about nine months, I think. How have you seen UMBC's commitment to athletics play out since you've arrived on campus? We know it's been a little bit different um, since we've been mostly virtual, but can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, a little bit different is one way to describe this year. That's good. Um, but no, it, it's, I'll tell you, the the, the support for athletics, um, you see it in the people that, the people we interact with on campus. And, and you know, Greg Simmons is on the call today, um, who's our, the VP for advancement here, who oversees athletics and is a tremendous, tremendous supporter. Um, Freeman Rabowski, the president of the university, who you all know, um, is a tremendous supporter. And not not just in words, but in actions and um, you know, it means so much to have people on campus who support us in every way. And I think that's been, um, for me, that's what's made, you know, what, what could be a really challenging year, and certainly it has been a challenging year. It's also been a great year. And it's been a great, you know, it's been a great professional year for me and, and a personal year for me to just work with the kinds of people that we have at UMBC. And I think anybody who went here probably experienced what a special place it is and the kind of people that, that go to school here, that work here, um, that teach, that coach. Um, I felt that support from day one. And so it's made it's made like an incredibly challenging year in the real world um, into a great year here on campus, despite all this. And, you know, I know because of that, I know that we'll get through this and I know that we'll come out of it stronger, just like we talked about earlier. Um, but the support has been unwavering, um, even in the face of some some tremendous financial and logistic and all kinds of challenges this year. Um, there has not been one second where I thought or I doubted that uh, that we had 100% backing from campus, and it's been awesome. Thank you. And can you give us an update on the state of the stadium complex renovation project? Yeah. So I, you know, I've kind of I, I sort of got thrown in um, midstream on the on the stadium renovation project, but it's an awesome um, opportunity for us as a department. And you know, I think the the timeline really hasn't been impacted by uh, by the COVID shutdowns. So I think we're looking at the spring of 22 when you'll start to see the results. Um, the the I think the biggest impact you'll see, you know, there's kind of going to be a, and we have some renderings that at some point will become final and we can get out there publicly, I think. Um, but the idea is that that kind of when you walk to into the stadium complex, you're going to feel like you're entering a stadium complex. Unlike right now, it's kind of just a set of fields or a set of uh, state, you know, kind of uh, venues. 
um, there's really going to be a central ent entryway that's um, that's decorative and and you can tell that you're walking into a Division One facility. Um, you know, a spot to gather and watch watch games and and um, you know uh, eat tailgate whatever you whatever have you. Um, I hope I hope I didn't go wrong there saying tailgate, Greg. Um, but you know, like a good gathering spot to watch games, both for for men's and women's lacrosse and also for um, baseball and softball. So. It, you know, you'll see a pretty big difference when that happens. And the other thing is it's a, a replacement for the press box, um, better restrooms. I, you know, we couldn't have worse restrooms. We'll, we'll definitely have better restrooms. Um, all of that is going to be part of the project. So I think the, the, the you know, the way you're going to feel the stadium improvement project is as a fan. When you when you come, come back to watch a game, you're going to really feel the difference from right now, which is important because right now it's, you know, you, you come to watch lacrosse. You're not getting a, you're not getting any extras <laughs> under the current setup. When 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 the stadium project's finished, you're going to feel a lot more comfortable watching games and more like you're in a Division One venue, which is great. We found actually these renderings online. Are we not allowed to show those? Because I've been showing them to recruits. Sure. <laughs> I mean, if they were online, I, you know, I'm, the only reason I say not to show them is I just think they they could still be changing because we're kind of still in the design phase. But it's not a state secret. I think they're on our website, but so I guess they're okay. Yeah, they're, I'm sure they're fine. Just don't just don't look at them as final. Well, maybe at the end of the call, if Liz has time, well, I can show. I'm really good at screen sharing now these days. <laughs> um, Brian, besides the stadium complex, are there any other big projects on the horizon for the department? We, well, we've we've just kind of completed the um, the soccer stadium up, upgrade. So we've we've got beautiful, you know, beautiful upgraded seating in the stadium in the soccer complex. Just in time to not have our season this year, unfortunately. Um, but that's going to be another great place to watch a game moving forward. We're doing, you know, we're also doing some work with our with our marketing partners, particularly Under Armour, um, to do some more branding around both of the stadiums so that it looks, you know, again, it kind of just it just dresses it up a little bit and looks more like a Division One facility. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a huge fan of chain link. I don't know how you guys feel. Um, we're trying to cover as much of the chain link as we can and make it feel just a little more permanent. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, obviously, if you haven't been back in the last couple of years, I don't know how um, how far back some of our alums go, but the event center is the ultimate improvement to our to our facility. Um, and that's in place now. So, you know, we do have we do have some things moving forward. And, and you know, is COVID, is COVID going to throw us a curveball and set back some of our um, some of our planning and our ideas? Sure. But the. the the stadium project is rolling forward, um, like I said, not delayed, and, and we'll have other things in the future, too. And I know Amy's got some thoughts and ideas, and um, we're going to keep moving forward and getting better. Thanks. Amy, going back to this year, how will UMBC stack up in the America East? We're going to crush it. Um, no, we're, uh, like I said, we are a very, very aggressive, fast, um, team with a lot of experience, you know, our seniors, a majority of them have played from, you know, basically day one um, and really migrated through the system. Um, you know, our sophomores got half the season last year. Um, our juniors have really like grown into their own and are just like a really awesome group of like um, pivotal players and role players, which we really needed to fill our team. And then our freshman class is just like young, vibrant, athletic, and I feel like they can run for days, which is a gift in the sport of lacrosse now. So I think every class is literally bringing something new to the table, which is just incredible. And all you can ask for as a coach, it's going to be really tough when it comes down to say, all right, who's playing in this position today? Because we have really great players that can fill all those needs. So um, I really think we're going to stack up awesome in the America East and, um, you know, super excited. I wish this was, you know, a year that we got to play every single team. Um, we obviously don't know what that's going to look like, but um, I feel really confident with the, the group that we have that we're going to be able to do a lot of things with this group. Um, and all we really need from them is their buy-in, which they've already shown they're capable of doing. So um, really the sky's the limit. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. Thanks. Um, I'm going to stop our questions right there and turn it over to anyone who's on the call to ask any questions. If you missed this before, um, if you could just use the raise hand feature so that we're not all off mute at the same time. Zoe, I saw that you raised your hand a while ago. <laughs> Do you have a question? Hold on, you're still muted. I got you. Um. Yeah, so I was actually talking to a couple of girls who are currently on the team, like just a couple of the seniors, 
And we were talking about like the mental health of a lot of the students right now being obviously uh, really secluded and different than, I mean, what I went through and what the current seniors, whoever's on the team who aren't freshmen uh, know and obviously had to deal with. Um, so basically we were just talking about like, I know in prior like years we've had um, people come to before practices or just on our off days or something and talk to us about mental health. Like we did brave, which I thought was awesome um, for those who remember that. But basically I just wanted to ask like, what are you guys going to do for the student athletes to help like their mentality, not decrease at all. Like if you go through the fall and then say all of a sudden COVID hits again and spring is canceled, like how are you going to combat their mental like wellness to prepare for that if it happens? Yeah, great question. I mean, Zoe, you know that this is like something really important to obviously to me and that we have obviously had people on in the past. Um, well, we have the um, the Retriever Project, which has been really awesome and a really huge presence um, in our UMBC community. So they've been doing a lot of work to really help combat some of these like new COVID issues that may arise. Um, and we, you know, obviously not being able to have the people on campus because of you know campus rules has really obviously has been a little bit challenging but we've had a couple of zoom calls um with christian brinley who is really someone who just kind of helps like the the morale and the mentality of each person on our team so she came and spoke to us early in the semester and she'll come back again um before we leave for the semester so a lot of that stuff has really been um, addressed from like the Retriever Project, Kristen Brindley coming on, um, and really just trying to like do my weekly or monthly checkups with everyone just to kind of make sure that we're staying on the, the right the right path. But this is clearly something that um, you know it it help, it hurts all year round, and especially in COVID times, it's a little bit more elevated. Zoe, it's nice to see you again. We, we uh, just so you know, as a department too, we've, you know, we've contracted with a mental health professional to meet with student athletes on a regular basis. So we've kind of brought somebody in from the outside to meet with any student athletes that are either reporting or that we're seeing um, concerns with. Um, they have an opportunity every week. I think it's every week to meet with that, um, with that healthcare professional and talk, which is, you know, that's one point of contact that we have. And then, you know, the other thing we've done for, for several of our teams is, and I, it, I know Amy's done it as well, is had sports psychologists come speak with the teams about kind of motivation and staying positive during this time because you know th that's one of the real challenges we see is if you're a you know if you're a soccer player or you're a cross country runner and you find out in August that your season isn't happening how do you stay committed to train as hard as you need to train to be a division 1 athlete for that fall and you know so to your point that's that's a that would be a concern in the spring we you know we don't anticipate this happening again in the spring but it certainly could um you know, and if, if we got to that point, we'd try and do some of the same things for, for our spring athletes. We we really don't expect that to happen, but we've we've come to expect the unexpected this year, right? Thanks, Zoe. Um, Anna. Hi. Um, so you guys mentioned the update project for the stadium. My question is you know, being a high school coach and listening to girls with their recruiting questions and, you know, things that make their final decision, what type of um, lacrosse update will be involved in that facilities update? Will we be getting, you know, private locker rooms, private bathrooms, newer locker rooms? What's the plan for the women's lacrosse specific stuff within the stadium? That, so the the locker rooms are a little bit outside the scope of that that particular project, but it's you know in the, moving forward we you know I think outdoor locker rooms attached to that stadium as well as our other facilities are a high priority. So that's one of the things on our radar screen in terms of future projects. You know when we talked about things that we want to do moving forward, um, you know I would for me I would put uh, locker room space or, you know, improved locker room space outside. And, you know, the other one, and I'm going to say this out loud, even though I, you know, we're, we're certainly not there right now, but it would be in uh, indoor practice space, you know, which I think is really important moving forward for for all of our outdoor sports. So, you know, those are things that we're going to chip away at and try and find a way to make happen over the over the next few years. Um, but the stadium project that's already in motion doesn't contemplate locker room space. It's, it's really about um, improving the it's mostly about improving the fan experience. 
I have some pretty lofty goals because I would love to make a women's lacrosse only facility. So um going to need some cash money for that. But um, obviously, that's something that I've kind of had my eye set on since um, I really got to UMBC. So I think that's I think our program is kind of owed that. And I know Greg's probably sitting there like, oh, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, but, you know, those are just the lofty goals that I really think that um obviously it may not be attainable tomorrow but things that i think if we put in the forefront and really work towards um you know i don't see why they couldn't be attainable we just have to dig in the right pockets yeah and i, I think it's you know my my philosophy on these types of improvements within a program i've been around for some pretty large ones at other schools it's good to have audacious huge goals like that i i think we should and then it becomes an issue of how do we chase them how do we tackle them how do we make them happen um, but if you don't have those, if you don't have those audacious goals, then you, then you never get those things. So, you know, we, we have to put those on the horizon and try and make those things happen. So that's, that'll be our focus as, as we move out of the stadium project. All right. Just wondering. Thanks, Anna. Um, Jen Mustin. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks. This is great. Obviously, I'm a very proud alum. I played a very long time ago. Um, I guess I'm just interested in hearing, I guess, from an athletic director standpoint, from an administrative standpoint, and then even from the college standpoint and, and, and from the president, what are the expectations of the women's lacrosse program in terms of competition, in terms of the winning tradition, championships? I mean, I, I think we all hear and see the the hunger that the coaching staff has and that the team has, but how is the administration um, viewing this program and what standards and expectations and resources do you guys have and give to the Women's Across program to be successful? Well, that's a, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of things to unpack there. Um, okay. You know, the first thing I would say is, you know, we, we wouldn't be, you know, we're not participating in sports that we don't think we can win America's championships in. You know, we've got a pretty um, we've got a pretty uh, narrow set of of sports that we sponsor, and the expectation is that we can win championships in every one of them. And I certainly, given where we are in the history of this area in lacrosse and Amy's background in lacrosse, like I have no doubt that we can win America's championships and, and go to NCAA tournaments from here. It's it's you know, and that I think I think all of you would want that to be the expectation and the goal. Um, you know, especially in a sport like lacrosse that means so much to the school. So. There's no doubt that's the goal. Um, you know, we we are, I guess, from a resource standpoint, from the institution's perspective, you know, we want to pr provide this oper this uh, program the opportunities to be on a level playing field with our competitors in the league, and that's what we do. Um, what I, what we're looking to do is expand that and and provide even more resources and remove even more obstacles, and that's where the friends of our program come in. Um, it, you know, that's where we have to, that's where we have to dig deep to find those resources and find those folks that can help us because that's, you know, the state's going to support us to put us on a level playing field and they do that, uh, or, or, you know, rather the institution, but for us to go above and beyond and do the really special things that we want, like when we want to build an indoor practice facility, when we want to do, uh, you know, sports specific facilities, that's where we need help. And we've got to, it's, it's incumbent on Amy and myself and, and our, you know, our staffs to, to find that help. But I, but as I said before, I, you know, the university has put us on level footing with the with our competitors in the conference, and I, I don't know that that was always the case. Like, you know, going back a decade or more, um, but but I feel like that's where we are now, and that we can win championships right now. Thank you. I mean, that's that's really good to hear, just because I know a bunch of us, like Amy said, are coaches. We're in college athletics. Um, I myself am also in athletic administration at my department, and so. I know that when an athletic director places high standards and expectations on a program and on a coaching staff, that really helps um, just because, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I just know that it, it helps in terms of knowing the importance of where your sport lies within that program, within that school, and you have that backing from your administration. So, you know, I don't, 20 years ago when I played, you know, I know the athletic director was, was great and he's in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure how much of a winning tradition was placed on our coaching staff for us to win, and I know that's needed. So if you're saying that you're you're providing that atmosphere, I'm I'm really excited to see that. So thank you. Yeah, I, you know, the, look, I, I'm a 
I love the I love the Division three model of athletics too, where where it's just a co-curricular activity and you, you know you win you lose it's an experience. This is Division one. You know, I think everybody's expectation from the players to the coaches to all the way up to the president of the university is that we're competing for championships. That's that's one of the reasons we do what we do. Um, you know, it, and I also I'll also tell you just in my background, you know, I've been at I've been at multiple schools where we had we had less resources than anybody in our conference. I was in I was in the Mountain West Conference with Nevada. We were the 11th budget out of 11 and we won conference championships. We went to the NCAA tournament in men's basketball. We you know, all those things. I was at Central Connecticut the last few years. We had absolutely the lowest budget in the Northeast Conference. We won seven conference championships in two years. It can be done. It can be done. And, you know, it's not all about the resources. We want to give enough resources that we can be competitive. And I think we do that. Um, but then from there, it's, you know, are, do we have the, the winning culture? Do we have the winning expectations? And that's what we're trying to build. It doesn't look like we have any more questions at this time. Um, so thanks to those of you who asked a few more questions. So Brian and Amy, I'll hand it back over to you for any closing remarks, and then I'll just go over a couple of things and I will leave this meeting open when we're done in case any of you want to stay on and connect with one another. So Brian, Amy. Yeah, I'll let Amy have the final word, but I, you know, my, my, once again, I'll just keep, I'll just keep beating this drum. Thank you. Um, it means a lot to me that this many people were willing to take the time and, and listen and ask questions and be engaged with us. Um, it, you know, it's, it's just critically important that we have that we have a family around this program and that's what we're trying to do. So I, I just thank you all for your time and your attention and your questions and your, and your care and your investment in the program. And I hope you have a, a great uh, rest of your week and I'll let Amy finish up. Yeah, just to echo that, um, I'm just really thankful that you guys all turned out today. Um, and whether you saw it on a text from me or a group me from me or um, posted on Instagram, you guys, you know, showing up is is you know what it's all about. And you guys certainly have done that. Um, I'm just like so happy and so proud of you guys that continue to want to be a part of something that's really, really going in an awesome direction. And we really couldn't do it without the the way that you guys have paved for us. So we're super excited to continue to grow as as a as a university, as a team. Um, and we certainly couldn't do it without you guys who have you know come in the past. And you know, currently you guys who are here, some of my current players who are on right now, um, we take this very seriously. And we take the commitment to being a UMBC retriever it, to heart. And this is something that's very special to all of us and I know it's special to all of you guys so we're just so thankful that you guys continue to be a supportive part of our program and we cannot wait to get to that you know time where we can do a, a downtown Baltimore bar night or an awesome alumni game or um, a great bull roast where you guys can all be a part of it and we're just again really thankful for you guys to take the opportunity today to just um, hear us speak about the state of our our team and our university and we thank you thank you thank you Thank you, Brian and Amy, and I would also like to thank everyone for being on today. Um, we will send this recording out via email in case anyone wants to rewatch it or share it with um, other alumni that may not have been able to join us today. Please share it on social media if you can. Share it, share it, share it. Feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any additional questions. And like I said, I'll leave this meeting open. It won't be recording if you guys want to stay on and um you know talk with each other thanks again thanks everyone thank you